All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Native Fuse Alliance Student Showcase. This is a seminar series sponsored by the NSF Includes Alliance, which is titled Broadening Career Pathways in Food, Energy, and Water Systems with and within Native American Communities, otherwise known as the Native Fuse Alliance. So my name is Dr. Kathy Isaacson, and I'm here representing the American Indian Higher Education Consortium, or AHEC, which is a nonprofit organization that advocates for the 37 tribal colleges and universities in the US. And AHEC serves as the backbone organization for the Native Fuse Alliance. So this uh, student showcase aims to show the outstanding work of our students. And today we'll get to hear from two of them and how they address food, energy, and water challenges in indigenous communities and building curriculum to support Native American students. And in addition, this showcase aims to connect students across the Alliance and provide mentorship and support from the audience that's in, in attendance. And so this showcase occurs every Thursdays at 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our first uh, speaker. Our two speakers today are Mark Clytus and Chris Yazzie. And they're both at the University of Arizona, and they're also um, NSF NRT trainees in the Indigifuse program. Each of the speakers will speak for 20 minutes, and then we'll have five minutes or so of questions, and we hope it can be dialogue. So let me first introduce Mark Clytus. Mark is a first-generation PhD student studying American Indian Studies at the University of Arizona. He has a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Oklahoma State, two master's degrees in Information Technology Management and Environmental Science. Wow, Mark, you're busy. Mark has worked in industry and at the tribal colleges and universities for many years. Mark aims to go into administration and higher education and hopes to develop culturally relevant and empowering STEM curriculum for higher education institutions. So Mark's talk today is entitled Indigenous STEM Engineering, an analysis integration of decolonization perspective for cultural sustainable engineering education curriculum in higher education for Native American students. You need an acronym for that, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna hand the platform now over to Mark Clytus um, and I will give you uh, some indication when there's five minutes left, I'll do this. Well, <clears throat> thank you, everyone. I appreciate being here today. Um, again, that's uh, my title there. I am, um, again, like my introduction was talking about, I'm first generation and I'm really passionate about engineering education. The other picture I have on my title slide here is my major advisor. Her name is um, Dr. Mary Jo Tippeconic Fox, and she is my major advisor in this research. So today I'm going to kind of go over a brief introduction with you guys of what um, some of my research is. We have an overview um, on indigenous uh, STEM, cultural sustaining um, engineering. I will be talking about my research questions, cultural engineering concepts. Um, also my research paradigm, I'm using two different methodologies that, I'm, um, that are mixed methodology, indigenous research methodologies, but the main one I'm working with is indigenous research methodology and infusing that with my mixed methodology approach, um, doing my quantitative and qualitative analysis. I'm also, my research framework I will be using um, from Dr. Gregory Cahetti, who's one of the uh, well-renowned um, native scholars um, on using his indigenous science model that I will be talking about how I'm going to be creating my own indigenous uh, engineering model. And then I'll have my conclusion. So when I began my research, I was doing a lot of keyword search initially in my um, PhD program when I first started. And these are just a couple of the research uh, keywords that I was looking up. A lot of these research questions, uh, I mean, keywords here, I could not find actual um, literature that was really on this area, except for the um, indigenous education, 
um, a lot of on the um, culture responsive engine um, pedagogy um, and cultural sustaining engineering curriculum. That that was not actual keywords, so I had to break it down to where I found more articles about cultural sustaining pedagogy, indigenous or American Indian education. And then I start looking at engineering education. So these are some of the concepts, keywords I came up in my research. And so a lot of it um, in further discussions with other native scholars uh, and going to workshops, a lot of the work now is being recognized about indigenous STEM and as a whole as a big conglomerate. But my emphasis is on engineering education. So a brief overview, um, I, you guys could po possibly read this, but um, our indigenous native communities are, their, their cultural knowledge is not really seen around the world a lot and appreciated. So um, I, what I, in this aspect of STEM, and I wanted to emphasize my research on engineering because I find it very um, interesting and importance to take notice about what the contributions of indigenous or Native American communities have done um, with engineering and what they have implemented type of engineering technology in, in society before there was colonization on um, the land here in the United States. And then so I, I'm doing a little bit of um, analysis on what the contributions of Native Americans in the comparison to Western um, civilization or colonialized look at engineering. So um, what I have found that a lot of things Native Americans have done are a lot of the engineering marvels that compared to Western civilization that are still being wondered to, to today. How are they, how they were built, why they were built, what was the significance of it? And so that's where I'm kind of putting the historical context with my research on engineering education. And I'm gonna be looking at other um, examples of cultural art, uh, um, I'm sorry, architecture, and looking at some of the contributions of like water conduits here in the transport of water here in Arizona. Now, my research is really emphasizing more into the Arizona area with the 22 federally recognized tribes here in um, Arizona. And so, like I said before, my research um, educational framework by Dr. Kahedi, I'm taking his model and I'm gonna infuse a newer model, which I'll be creating an indigenous engineering education model that will incorporate a lot of indigenous perspectives um, I feel this research really needs to be done in engineering education curriculum in higher ed because this has never been looked at. The literature gap that I found when it comes to cultural sustainable or cultural um, relevant, responsive, whatever word you want to use at looking at cultural sustaining pedagogy, there was no literature that stipulate what CSP is incorporating in engineering education. Now, this is where I'm trying to infuse this into the higher ed education curriculum on different um, engineering disciplines. And those disciplines, I'm looking at most of the engineering disciplines a lot of our Native American engineering students kind of go into and see how we can incorporate those perspectives in the curriculum while they're going through their matriculation of the engineering education. That's why I'm saying a critical indigenous lens, a different perspective of understanding engineering education in higher ed. Now, my research questions, I originally started off like with five research questions when I first came in as a PhD student. However, after careful consideration of time and energy, I have reduced my research down to two research questions now. And my concentration is here again, like I said, in Arizona. But my first research question is, why don't engineering programs in the Southwest United States incorporate indigenous native cultural sustaining pedagogy? Like higher ed institutions in Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, and then what issues might prevent them from implementing um, a Native American cultural sustaining pedagogy in higher ed? The, these institutions in high, of higher ed in the First Nations, 
um, Aboriginal nations in Australia and Maori nations in New Zealand have been doing the incorporation of CSP, but they don't call it cult cultural sustainable pedagogy in the um, um, international institution. It's more of indigenous knowledge incorporated in higher ed. And they've been doing this since the early 90s. The Maori nation and New Zealand have been doing this quite some time. And from my research in Australia, they have um, are, uh, mandated that indigenous knowledge and education must be implemented in higher ed from the um, uh, uh, Department of Education in Australia. Our First Nations uh, are, are doing that as well due to the Truth and Reconciliation um, Committee that's uh, with the First Nations uh, against, well, not against, that represent the, that commission represents the um, higher ed and a couple um, First Nations to Canada, Canada's government to incorporate indigenous knowledge and reconcile the, um, the issues of education for, Native, for First Nations students in Canada, but they are implementing this work in engineering education in the higher ed at various um, higher ed institutions in Canada. My second question is, how would a cultural sustainable pedagogy engineering curriculum be applied in higher ed education? My two um, questions I'm kind of looking at, does CSP increase or retain more indigenous uh, slash Native American engineering students? And how do you include native languages into STEM for indigenous and Native American students in engineering? That last question, the, the reason why I'm incorporating language because my research is gonna be um, including more um, community-based learning um, and implementation of different ways of Native American students can work with engineering projects on particular tribal nations. And if you don't know the language or the culture, it's, it, it causes some kind of conflict in some respects, because when you're talking to your community elders and you're not really understanding where the lang what language they're speaking or what they're wanting for different projects or respecting their knowledge, then that's what needs to be done. And I have worked with my committee on a couple of different things, how I'm going to implement this as a capstone project with the curriculum. Now, research has found that um, cultural sustainable pedagogy from uh, Miss uh, from Dr. Montoya here, re this cultural sustainable pedagogy evolved from cultural relevant pedagogy from um, uh, Gladys and uh, I'm sorry, Gladys. Uh, I, I forgot what the the author's name was, but it was originally started from the cultural relevant pedagogy, and then. Um, that was deepened into academic learning of cultural relevant pedagogy. And then the, there was another focus about cultural competence in higher ed, the social political consciousness. And so now cultural sustainable pedagogy is being impl um, implemented in a lot of the K through 12 curricula, but not a lot in higher ed as compared to our international institutions. Now, um, these are a couple examples that I am talking about with cultural engineering about this. This is the home of Dr. Michael Johnson. He was gracious enough to let me um, have a couple of pictures of his uh, Hopi home, which he had developed on his own. And this is the pictures of Melon female Hogan. Um, a lot of in English terms call it Hogan. But um, this picture here and this picture here the three are Dr. Michael Johnson's homes and what he built and using natural materials and how the architecture was. This is also, he talks about how he built his home with the foundation and understanding Mother Earth and the different types of materials and how far he had to dig his foundation and, and how he built his home and using the different types of rocks and materials there. This is the fire pit here to the right here that talks about, um, you know, how he heats his home. But there's a lot of engineering concepts dealing with this with like thermodynamics and fluid flow um, dynamics as well when you're heating the home. This is another concept about, you know, our um, Alaska natives that when they're building their home, and this was something about what laws of physics I found in some of my research 
how physics is applied to this particular dwelling as well and how it was sustainable. This is another one I found um, by um, one of this native, uh, uh, she's not a scholar, but she's an act activist and talking about different things the natives have done. And like, um, she's talking about heated floors and this is a, a, a wigwam uh, for some of the um, tribes back out east and how the different materials from the trees was built and how to heat the, heat the um, home and stuff. So these are all sustainable type of cultural engineering that I wanna incorporate. I also, in my research paradigm, I'm using the four R's of higher ed. Um, I have looked at the indigenous methodology through Dr. Sweeney Winchief and um, Dr. San Pedro here. And within their um, indigenous methodology of storytelling, they're incorporating the native philosophy, which was the four R's were originally incorporated by uh, Kirkness and Barnhart, but through their article in 2019, they were doing the four R's, which shows the respect, higher ed needs to respect indigenous students, the relevance of indigenous students and their culture, responsibility of making the university more responsive to uh, indigenous, indigenous students, and most of all, the reciprocity those involved with the university and students sh um, share the benefit for other knowledges as well. Um, and also my mixed methodology is uh, a survey I'm developing or have developed actually um, when I took the class with Dr. Jameson Lopez. And this is the source here on indigenous st statistics that merges indigenous research methodology and understanding the quantitative research methodologies that I will be incorporating in my survey to get data, quantitative data and qualitative data where I'll be interviewing um, different um, Native American engineering students with ACES as at the three PWIs and some pre-engineering students at TCUs as well. And this is my research framework. That's of course, Dr. Kahedi. This is his publication of his indigenous research uh, science model from this book. And I had, he signed it for me and I got a copy of it. But as I looked at it, this is what I'm gonna re re redesign. I'm gonna keep the components, a little bit of the components and foundations as you can see here. But some of the research design here, I'm gonna be incorporating some of the analysis of engineering education and design with, um, with engineering curriculum and try to aim to make this research design a little different um, by incorporating, incorporating an indigenous education model. And then my conclusion, um, I feel like by getting this research with other Native American scholars, non-Native, I really want to um, apply this knowledge to our indigenous students so they can work with their communities, grow within their communities. And most of all, this is one good, one point that Dr. Uh, Wildcat at um, Haskell University talked about indigenizing education would um, would maybe more native students in academia could be recognized for future native scholars and native professional engineers. My future career, I want to incorporate indigenous STEM and incorporate my in, um, engineering education model to inspire more indigenous and native American students in academia um, or uh, professional mentorship to become Native STEM professionals. Also, hopefully, um, work with other Native American and Indigenous tribes to um, get more ind Indigenous perspectives in engineering education curriculum, and which help with Native Amer Native engineering students to incorporate into their their knowledge into their communities better by doing more community based engineering projects. Are there any questions or answers? Thank you so much, Mark. Wow. How exciting to hear about your research. And you're right on time. We have, um, you know, up to 10 minutes now for some discussion. So any questions, comments? I have a question. Mm -hmm. Hey, Alice. Oh, I'm really excited, Mark, about this research. It's, it's absolutely you know, exciting and has great potential. I'm, uh, I've done a lot of work in working on engineering education and bringing in cultural diversity and history into it as well. And I sent you some references of some work 
that if you haven't seen, you might be interested in. It okay. builds on, there's a whole literature that started out in mathematics called ethnomathematics. Are you familiar with any of that literature? Um, I did see a couple articles on, on math. Yes, I did have that in my lib, but not the actual term ethnomath mathematics. Yeah, what's exciting about ethnomathematics is mathematicians started taking, especially examples from Africa, like hair braiding, and mm -hmm. showing the mathematics of it. But what grew out of that was ethnoengineering. And so the articles I'm sending you are ethno-engineering. Okay. So um, I'd be happy to provide you any advice I can on this. I'm really excited about your research. I think it has great potential. And um, there are a number of journals that you can publish in, like the International Journal of Engineering Education. And some of the papers I sent you are journals that you might publish in as well. So kudos for great work and an important to topic. Yeah, I didn't get to add one thing in my presentation is my really my major emphasis of recognizing TCUs with their pathways into the bigger universities, because the TCUs are really doing a lot more of the, I guess now, like you say, ethno engineering, but the mission of the schools and their pre engineering programs are bringing this CSP curriculum in their type of disciplines, and it's not every dis engineering discipline. But what I'm trying to see if that will be helpful for more retention of and graduating of Native American engineers out of the PWIs. But I, I've seen like TCUs have that cultural impact and identity to push the students into transferring to the bigger university and their and the students are making it, you know, like my colleague who's fixing to present now, he he and I have talked numerous times. And I'm proud of him where he's at now and being a, a, a doctor in chemical engineering. I'm just like, whoa, you know. <laughs> so that's something I really um, is emphasizing in my um, dissertation as well. Well, you're asking the right research questions, but you uh, and and so I think you 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 got to develop. I, I haven't seen your methodology. I'd be happy to give you any feedback on it. But you're asking the right questions. Okay. And it's yeah, good to, you need to benchmark, you know, you need to figure out what it was before and after and do both qualitative and quantitative uh, studies on it. But it's really exciting. I appreciate that. Thank you. OK, any other questions or comments? Did you see there's a great um, comment in the chat? So thank you, Dr. Silva, if you saw that. Um... So thanks, Carla. Such a great presentation. And if you want to know more about ethnomathematics, I can help. Okay. Yes, I'll be in touch, Ms. Uh, Dr. Civil. Um, I'll put my email in the um, chat as well. So, Mark, do you have any questions or comments for the audience here? Anything we could um, discuss concerning your research? Well, one of my questions is how do you guys? Well, see me trying to um, deploy my survey with administrators in engineering ed. One of my one of my committee members was talking about I should just go and develop a workshop or go into a, a conference and develop a workshop where I could have people talk about CSP and engineering education and go to those kind of conferences and then talk about this and gather that type of data and that in that kind of respectful area. Because my first question, I knew it was gonna be a political question. I, I say political lightly, but dealing with universe, United States higher ed and international higher ed, I feel based upon my literature review and my research that the international institutions are growing faster in incorporating indigenous perspectives in engineering education than the United States. We do have, you know, our NSF, our grants and stuff, but what I'm finding out is not sustainable. You know, these 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 grants are not sustainable at the PWIs to help retain the um, knowledge and grow more of the um, engineering students. And that's what I'm finding out. It, it's, it's sporadic around the United States, and it's only certain populated native areas in the United States. Um, that's my compare and contrast with part of my research question. So that's one of my questions, how I would, you know, work with more 
um, administrators on this. Any comments to that question? <laughs> Dr. Civil had a comment. I don't know if you want to add to it. I, I'm not sure why administrators are what you're interested in. Well, because if I'm going to change curriculum, looking at curriculum and incorporating indigenous uh, perspectives in the curriculum, and my goal is to incorporate more community-based learning because our tribal nations have a huge need of engineering, especially with the new infrastructure bill that already came out. There's money coming down, but they don't have enough engineers. And so many tribal nations are outsourcing way too much um, resources to engineering firms when the intellectual uh, of their community is right there and their students, but they don't have a chance to work on those projects in those particular communities unless they are graduate students or, you know, incorporate with themselves into native owned businesses that have internships. So I'm looking at all those kind of components, working with native owned businesses and incorporating the engineers at early in their career. So as they matriculate through their undergraduate, they feel like they have a job and they're progressing and getting their professional prowess of being an engineer. And then they can feel proud that they're doing something with their community. You know, I think the curriculum is so based on capitalism. When you get into engineering, you one focus, you got to get it done, you stay here. But as you matriculate into your higher division of um, engineering, you, you, you don't really see the opportunities to work with a lot of communities until I, I say probably the last few, maybe five or 10 years, and the work that Dr. Chiefs has done, I'm so proud of that because it gives the perspective of students can work with their communities. And another thing, this is a wild idea that I had, how the NCAA pays their players in California. I don't understand why if universities want to do research on indigenous lands and native lands, why we cannot pay our students. Give them a job to do the work. Now, that's a concept. That's a wild concept. Yeah. <laughs> Raise eyebrows, but I think that should be fair because the institutions getting X amount of percentage of the grant, then you then the students are trying to struggle, get through the engineer. I think there should be a negotiation there. That's all. That's just a concept. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark, one, one uh, let me just plant this seed with you. I'm sure you've already been looking at Navajo Technical University's engineering program, and I've been very involved with that from the pre-engineering. Now we have the ABET certified four-year degree, and they are just showing, beginning to show some interest in working with Berkeley's developmental engineering program. Mm -hmm. Development. Development, development engineering program, and I think there's some tie in there. I know Navajo Technical yeah, I, I think that might be a place. The story there is fantastic. The students, how they've moved all the way, just the way you described. And now some of those students are, are serving as um, faculty. And so, I, matter of fact, that's what Dr. Chief put in. I used to teach at NTU and I did see that evolution. And now at Humboldt University, they're incorporating indigenous engineering. Yes. So I would love to get a hold of the colleagues over at Humboldt and see what they are looking at incorporating the curriculum of engineering to compare with other institutions here to um, do part of my research. So that's all. I I just feel like my first question is kind of controversial, but the way my committee members taught me to maybe get the data is to go into a workshop have a more calm collective area that people with interest you could talk about this and then I could great gather more of my quantitative data out of that. Good. Oh, okay. Just suggesting the administrators aren't the right people to talk to. I think the faculty in the alliance that are teaching in the target are you're talking about predominantly white institutions you want? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Talk to the faculty in the alliance, um, because I think many of them will be interested in, in, and excited about working with you and incorporating this into their curriculum. Okay. Okay, and I'm going to transition, Mark. We appreciated so much your presentation and the, the good dialogue here, um, because we're uh, so excited to move over to our second student speaker, Chris Yazi, and I'm 
um, happy to introduce Chris, and then we'll get started. So Christopher Brian Yazzie is a member of the Navajo Nation from the community of Tuba City, Arizona. He is currently working on his PhD in environmental engineering and his research focuses on the removal of uranium from groundwater by membrane filtration and electrochemical processes. He has um, previous water resource work experience with tribal, county, and state agencies. And Chris is currently a mentor in the USDA NEFA Bridge to STEAM program, which prepares tribal college students for graduate school. And apart from this PhD life, Chris loves listening to music and spending time with his family. And his talk today is entitled Feasibility Study of Secondary Effluent Treatment for Food Production in the Navajo Nation. Turn it over to Chris Yazzie. Thank you for that introduction. I'm going to share my screen right now. Sorry. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> so today I'm going to be talking about a feasibility study of secondary effluent treatment with microfiltration and nanofiltration for food production in Navajo Nation. Um, this, this study is a, um, <clears throat> is a product of a USDA grant that was funded to the uh, Diné College, Navajo Nation, and the U of A. Okay, just a little background. I think we all know about the water scarcity happening. It feels like around the world, but especially in here in the Southwest. <clears throat> the um, Arizona's been in a drought for over two decades, um, which is stressing agriculture, the agriculture industry. Um, yeah, let me change my share screen real quick. I'm not seeing what I should be seeing. Okay, well, we'll just um, keep going. <clears throat> but, but one possible solution is wastewater reuse. <clears throat> Um, some background on the social economic conditions on the Navajo Nation currently. Um, there's a lack of available public infrastructure on Navajo Nation, which means about 20,000 residents on Navajo Nation lack um, piped water to their homes as well as electricity to their homes. But including that, there's a lack of economic um, opportunity over half of the uh, population, the adult population on Navajo Nation is unemployed. <clears throat> and not only that, there's high levels of food insecurity on Navajo Nation, <clears throat> which means that there's a short supply of affordable, healthy foods. And just an, an, ex an example, um, the Navajo Nation is about, the population is about 160,000 people. And for those 160,000 people, there's less than a dozen food grocery store is something that we know like Safeway, Fries, and just this um, lack of food is, it causes people to have to travel far distances for water, for food, but a lot of it comes down to just um, people eating um, unhealthy foods, a lot of processed foods, <clears throat> but what water reuse a water reuse uh, program could provide on Navajo Nation is, of course, um, um, jobs because of the agricultural industry, as well as um, we could start, the Navajo Nation could produce more healthy foods that is um, locally um, sustainable. So what is water reuse? And what, what will I be talking about water reuse in um, regards to, well, the EPA um, defines it as a method of recycling water, um, recycling treated wastewater for beneficial purposes. The graph I, that is shown here is just an example from 2009. And this, these are what California has re, have uh, purposes that California has reused water 
uh, over 10 years ago, who see the majority of it is used for agricultural and irrigation uses already. So, and a lot of these uses are dictated by um, the characteristics of the water after treatment, such as physical, chemical, and biological treatments um, characteristics. So, the better the water is treated, the basically the more water, the the more uses that the water could be used. Ultimately, going up to which I think a lot of states and countries around the world is the potable reuse of water. Um, I won't be talking about that. My talk is mostly about water reuse for irrigation. So this example is a conventional wastewater reuse treatment train. Uh, this is orange, this is a schematic for Orange County, which is Los Angeles's um, water district. You can see that the water's entering filter screens and it goes through a microfiltration. And then the microfiltration water then goes to some pumps. There's some pH treatment, anti-scalate treatment, but it just goes, it ultimately just goes through the reverse osmosis membrane that permeate then gets treated by UV light. It gets um, some more treatment for pH. And then in this example, the water is being sent to injection wells. The picture below is what a typical um, reverse osmosis water treatment facility looks like. Basically a big enclosed facility full of uh, membrane vessels. The water reuse, Tucson, the uh, town um, U of A is in, does have a water reuse program. It's um, the water reuse is identified by the purple pile. Um, the water here in Tucson is used for ground recharging as well as um, environmental restoration for riparian areas. And also a lot of these purple pipes get sent to the parks in town, which then is used for um, irrigation for the grass. Um, as far as I know or could research, there's little to no water use in Navajo Nation. Maybe some families have gray water systems that they use, but um, but anything kind of to a larger scale is um, non-existent as far as I know. Of. So, like I said earlier, this water this project is um, a product of um, a USDA grant. The grant number is down below, and this is just a quick uh, figure to show the stakeholders and um, the responsibilities of each group. This work is ultimately for the Navajo Nation, uh, farmers on the Navajo Nation, and for the Navajo Nation government to at least use this information that, we, that we're um, creating for future um, uh, water reuse policies. <clears throat> Diné College, um, they have, um, they conduct water sampling for us. They're currently getting trained to conduct microbiological analysis themselves. They're confronting some of the societal issues and they're also working directly with stakeholders such as the, the farmers who are um, actively um, using surface water for irrigation. And here at UVA, we're doing a lot of the water analysis, the, the treatment analysis, the treatment fe feasibility, and also we've, um, this past summer with this project, we were able to bring four Diné College students down to U of A for, the, for about a week throughout the summer. And there they were being trained. They were working side by side of us um, in the lab, working on the uh, equipment, water treatment equipment, the um, preparation for analysis and membrane characterization. And I think that was uh, really rewarding and for me and also for the students. So this, um, like I said, this USDA project, it's, it's pretty big. There's a lot of moving parts, a lot of people's um, uh, specialized um, professors that are needed. But the rest of my talk is only talking about the technical and regulatory aspect of this project. So we, we will be um, doing the water treatment, the water quality analysis, 
as well as um, collecting regulation and guidelines for water reuse. So the three um, goals of this project is one, to conduct initial water quality as assessment of secondary effluent from Navajo Nation. Second goal is to conduct treatment experiments using microfiltration and nanofiltration. And third is to develop a solution framework for water reuse for agriculture on Navajo Nation. So first, um, site characteristics. Uh, we got water from Tuba City and Chinle wastewater treatment facilities, which are operated by the Navajo, the NTUA Navajo Tribal Utility Authority. Um, both of these sites are within the uh, Colorado Plateau and Northeastern Nav um, Navajo Nation, Arizona. Tuba City operates at about a little more over, over a half a million gallons per day while the Chinle site operates a little bit lower um, flow rate at 0.38 million gallons per day. Both of these sites facilities are facultative treat water tr wastewater treatment lagoons. They both look similar to what the picture, the, the picture here, there's multiple cells. <clears throat> the water gets transported cell to cell. Um, some of these cells are operated um, by aerators, so they're um, aerobic, and that is to remove and reduce the biological oxygen demand, while some of these cells are operated with no aeration, therefore they go anaerobic, and that is to remove the nutrients such as nitrates, ammoniums, nitrogens, uh, phosphate, and sulfates. Both of these sites operate as treatment as state status with the EPA, Therefore, there's some leniency to discharging, discharge, as well as there's some flexibility and operation of both of these sites. But also that kind of gives way to both of these sites uh, are known by, and you can check, um, it's available, publicly available at the EPA ECHO website. Both of these facilities um, discharge high levels of nitrates. If um, and I and this is kind of unique to any other um, wastewater treatment facility in the in the nation, really, because if any of these if these uh, facilities were being operated anywhere else, they'd probably be fined. So the treatment as state status with the Navajo Nation um, definitely um, allows some flexibility in these. Um, facility operations. So working with our stakeholders, um, we were able to identify 73 analytes to look at in our study. And they're color coded right now to the type of analysis that is used to quantify that um, analyte. So we have IC, um, ICPMS as well as LCMS. And from this list that we see here, I will only be talking about the analytes that exceeded the water treatment uh, standard. So this um, table here is starting to show some of the, um, the effluent water quality results. So in the far right, columns are the effluent water quality for Tuba City and Chin Lee. And these values are in parts per million. And the they're color coded to the to the water quality standard in which it uh, violates. So I have some drinking water standards um, which are the blue, red, gray, and yellow, but I, I also have water reuse water quality standards which are in green. So these analytes, ammonium through lead, actually exceeded some type of water quality standard. So for the rest of the talk, I'll be more focused on the removal of these, um, since these were the only ones in uh, non-compliance from the 73 analytes I showed prior. Um, this table shows the contaminants of emergent concern, which we use LCMS to quantify. Many of these analytes are, um, like I said, they're contaminants of emerging concern. Therefore, it's really unknown to science what type of um, influence these has on these 
these have on human health or, or even animal health. The ones in yellow and red, they do have um, current guidelines, but the, um, the ones in red are actually exceeding the guidelines. So there are a few, I mean, there are a few of these contaminants of emergent concerns that are found in excess in these Tuba City and Chinle waters. But just to kind of clarify, most of these contaminants of emergent concerns aren't even um, degraded or removed from most modern wastewater treatment facilities anywhere in the United States. So, the, so right now the EPA is kind of in a um, kind of working on these currently to see exactly how they're going to um, regulate these um, contaminants in the future. So we're going to propose, so our lab, we propose the microfiltration and nanofiltration treatment system. And the, the goal of this is the microfiltration will remove larger particles that could um, damage the nanofiltration membranes, but the nanofiltration membrane will actually be able to remove the, the smaller remaining ions and molecules. But the nanofiltration is being used because instead of RO, because Nanofiltration produces more water, and it also can allow some of the smaller ions to pass through. And we're kind of interested in that because some of those smaller ions could be possible nutrients that are beneficial for agricultural agriculture. So we're interested in the um, resource recovery that NF can maybe provide. So here's the schematic from the pictures I showed you, just the water. We start with water, they go through a microfiltration system, it gets recollected in a 20 liter tank. And then from there, a high pressure pump then sends it through three different nanofiltration membranes, the NF90, NF245, and NF270. So we're, we're comparing three different membranes of how well each will um, respond to this type of um, water treatment. Chris, you have about three minutes left. Okay. <clears throat> so we see that the microfiltration was able to, um, didn't remove any condu conductivity, but we, um, we were, um, this is what we anticipated, but the microfiltration did remove over 90% of the total organic carbon, which are the larger particles. And just to, um, I didn't include a picture, but just visually, this water looks a lot cleaner going through this microfiltration. So these graphs show the rejection of conductivity. So these are the dissolved solids, so the, the ions that are dissolved in the water. And we show that, and we see throughout a 24-hour period that the rejection stays the same from one hour to 24 hour. And each one of these graphs um, shows a different membrane, and we see that the NF90 membrane can remove up to 90% of the TDS from the wastewater effluent, while the 245 and 270 removes about 45 to 50%. That's good news. Now, now we know that we're actually, these membranes can actually remove the total dissolved solids. Now, moving to the analytes that were in non compliance, that's what this graph shows. We, we see that the um, we see the levels of permeate, the concentrations of these analytes in the permeate. And the graph, the, the table below shows the, um, the guidelines. And if you compare the guidelines to the numbers, to the concentration of permeate, all of the, um, the permeate is in compliance with this irrigation. This is for Tuba City and this is for Chinle. So that's good news. What, what we see that is that this water, that the NF can remove water, that can produce water that can be used for irrigation. But something that we did see in our experiments is that the water flux was very was reduced over 24 hours for all three of the membranes, which is shown in these graphs, the y-axis being water flux. And the picture to the side shows that, that the membranes, you can see that there's a little discoloration. So there's definitely fouling occurring. So this, this could be mitigated maybe to operation, how you operate, maybe a higher uh, velocity or maybe periodic um, cleaning of the membrane. But overall, it looks like the membranes are gonna have to be changed out more frequently than we anticipated. 
So finally, we're going to the third part of the project, the, um, the decision framework of how to use this water and using it for irrigation. Well, the input, knowing that we have, um, we have objectives, water quality objectives, crop objectives, water quantity objectives, we can then use the decision uh, processing model, which, uh, which has um, different databases. This, these databases were collected and organized by undergraduate uh, Lauren Vasquez. Um, so using this decision, we could look at water treatment performances, water regulations, as well as crop informations to then make a decision on the membrane type to use uh, water quality quantity that we can expect, as well as what kind of crops can be used with this water, as well as brine characteristics for water, uh, for the wastewater, for the wastewater, um, for dealing with the wastewater. So in conclusion to my talk, we see that the, our uh, proposed microfiltration nanofiltration treatment train can provide acceptable water quality for irrigation, but there is still some future work is analyzing more of the contaminants of merging concern, looking at the microbiological aspects of the water, as well as some membrane characterization. But from the water, from what, we, what, what we've seen from the permeate, there is a, there's definitely a resource recovery opportunity especially for the nitrogen containing groups. Currently, the, um, currently if you buy, currently um, farmers, they buy the, this nitrogen and it's currently about at about a dollar per pound. But utilizing uh, this resource recovery, the, uh, it could give the Navajo farmers um, expand their crop types that they can plant on Navajo, but it could also extend the growing season. And it could also, um, yeah, and it, it could also become a, a resource industry for the nation. And ultimately this solution framework that I last talked about, right now um, in my research group, we're kind of looking at developing this into a type of app or maybe a website that stakeholders or farmers could use to help with the decision-making. <clears throat> and that will definitely um, be something being worked on in the in the immediate future. But um, yeah, so that pretty much concludes my talk that I have today. Definitely, I'd like to thank all the contributors that were part of this um, of collecting and um, getting through the data. Um, so I have the three of uh, the four Diné College students on here, which they definitely helped as well. And I'd like to thank the funding source and the grant writers as well for the USDA um, water reuse Navajo project. Mm -hmm. And that um, I'd like to think and take any kind of questions. Right, thank you so much, Chris. We have a, a few minutes, almost five minutes for questions. Any, anyone want to talk to Chris about his research? I was gonna add like, how, what is the cost of the membranes Chris, like you were saying that they might have to be replaced. So if this was a, the machine was implemented on the res um, at different, I guess, uh, trapper houses or water, sta or water um, state, when I say water stations, you know what I mean, the, the uh, yeah. wind mills or whatever. <laughs> but what's the cost of them to replace these membranes? Yeah, so definitely the past, 10 years, these membranes, the cost of them has dropped dramatically. But I, I can say that the majority of the cost will probably be the energy that's needed for the pumps. Oh, okay. And then maybe second, the the maintenance, the um the uh the cost for operation. So like hiring people, training and hiring people to operate. But um, but the membranes itself, it's it's a small percentage of the total O and M cost of a system like this. Thank you. Any other final questions for Chris? Go ahead, Alice. 
excellent research. It sounds very comprehensive. Uh, and you've done quite a bit. When do you expect to finish? Well, um, I think some of the initial research, um, I, I didn't show everything because uh, my advisor and I were trying to, we're in the process of writing a pipe paper on this work, kind of more targeted towards the contaminants of emergent concern and how just how high of a of um, nitrogen containing groups that the feed had. But the, uh, but I think the, by maybe the end of the year, we could actually have the solution framework kind of as like a prototype app or website, but it's gonna be a program to where, where a user can input the water quality, what their objectives are and get kind of a crop type and crop um, and how to utilize the water. That might be done like later this year. Exciting, thank you. So Chris, we have a question from Dr. Chief who's at the airport and she's asking, as a former TCU student, do you have some advice for students that are going from a TCU into PhD work? Can you comment on that? Yeah, um, I don't know, like for me, like hindsight's twenty twenty, and I think for every PhD student, it's, it's definitely a challenge regardless of where, you know, you're coming from TCU or from, somewhere else, but, you know, any kind of advice, I'd probably just, you know, stick, stick to you, whatever, you know, stick to your family and your friends and for support, because I think support is probably the most important aspect from family and friends to get through, especially kind of leaving the reservation and coming to like a large institution to get the, uh, yeah, I guess that's something quick I can really think, say. Okay, thank you so much. Any final comment, question? A couple minutes. I know as a social scientist myself, Chris, I'd loved hearing about your solution framework and the possibility of it becoming an app because you know our our leaders and our agencies they will need help in figuring out how to how to get from a to b so thanks yeah. for that yeah totally i mean when we started developing the solution we realized just how many ref i mean you have to constantly go to a reference and okay yeah. what's this crop like say corn corn needs a certain quantity of nitrate you know beans might might be like a certain quantity of nitrate will be toxic to it that would help like watermelons it's just yeah so I, I think my undergraduates definitely on the right track to try to make this our um, solution framework um, accessible to anybody that can use a app or a website excellent well at, all of us at the native fuse alliance want to give our support to you to both you and mark and we appreciate uh, so much the inspiration that that you've shown us today and and ongoing. Um, so as we close here, I just want to encourage everyone to remember we have another student showcase on April 13th at 1 p.m. Uh, we will be featuring two students, both Indigifuse trainees, Chantel Harrison and Jameis Lee, and they will be speaking about indigenizing controlled environment agriculture. So we hope to see you then. And you also might want to put on your calendar the Native Voices on STEM on May 3rd through the um, Indigenous Resilience Center, where they'll have two more Native Fuse Alliance students uh, presenting. So with that, please look into the chat and you'll see the flyer there if you want to grab that for this ongoing work. And um, thanks again to our students. You guys rock. Thank you. <laughs> OK. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.